welcome everyone to another episode of the Business Interview. I'm your host, Jalen Mobley, aka J Mob. Before we get started, I want to first thank all you guys for watching. This is not possible without your help, so please continue to like, comment, subscribe. We greatly appreciate it. We have a very special guest for you guys here today. He's a president here at Marshall University, co founder of Wing to Wing Foundation, a philanthropist, and a former executive chairman of Intuit, where he served as a CEO from 2008 to 2019 and is now known by Forbes as the richest man in the state of West Virginia with a net worth of $900 million. Everyone help me welcome Brad D. Smith. How hey, you doing, Brad? Doing great, Jalen. How are yes, you, sir. buddy? Great. It's good to see you. Yes, sir. Thank you. So you were born and raised in Canova, West Virginia. What was it like growing up in Canova, and how would you say it has shaped your perspective on life? Jalen, Canova is an iconic community here in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. Roughly 3,000 people if you round up. I had an idyllic childhood. Amazing parents, two wonderful brothers, mm -hmm. friends that have lasted a lifetime. And as I was growing up in that environment, I didn't realize it at the time, but there were four values that shaped who I am as a person and right. ultimately how I showed up throughout my career. The okay. first was integrity. Mm -hmm. The second was humility. The third was grit. And the fourth was teamwork. And if I unpack those for you, integrity we learned here that our words and our actions need to match. Right. When I got to Silicon Valley, they call that the say-do ratio. Right. Are you actually going to do what you say you're going to do? And so right. it was important for me to learn day one that you can do business on a handshake. Mm -hmm. Your word is your bond. The second was humility. We learned early on to not be afraid to ask for help mm -hmm. or to tell someone when we didn't have the answer. Well, right. when you get out to Silicon Valley, one of the first things they look for is a curiosity quotient. Mm -hmm. someone who has more questions than answers. And so right. I was once again prepared from childhood in Canova right. to be able to go out and thrive in an environment like that. Okay. The third was grit. Mm -hmm. We learn here that success and failure are the same, an opportunity to learn. If you get knocked down, you get up, you dust yourself off, you get right. back at it. When you get to Silicon Valley, one of the most popular books out there is Getting to Plan B by Randy Commissar. Mm -hmm. And it talks about the number of times a startup fails before it gets up and figures out the right solution. Right. And then last but not least is teamwork. And the Nate Ruffin room reminds us of that. I was six years old when the plane crashed in my hometown. Mm -hmm. I saw this community rise from the ashes, put their arms around each other, mm -hmm. and continue to move forward. And right. I learned that life's a team sport. So this idyllic childhood in this small community with amazing parents and brothers and friends mm -hmm. was ultimately the PhD that I needed to right. go forward in my career. Wow. And you just mentioned it, right? So many people have seen the movie We Are Marshall. And like you said, you were just six years old when a plane crashed carrying the 1970 Marshall University football team crashed just about outside of your home. So how did witnessing that tragedy and that community response instill lessons that you still carry today? I think for me, it was so important to see the empathy, the compassion, the care. Mm -hmm. When someone had lost a family member or a friend or a parent, in many cases, uh, this community reached out, put their arms around each other. Right. In fact, it so inspired me and my wife that our family foundation is known as the Wing to Wing Foundation. Right. And it's based on a quote by Anatoly France that says, each of us were born angels with one wing, mm -hmm. but we learned to fly by holding on to one another. Right. And so as I watched that sky glow red and my cousins were the first volunteer responders, wow. I didn't realize it at the age of six, but I learned it many years later Mm -hmm. that if we truly hold on to one another, we can overcome anything. In fact, the greatest lesson that I walked away from in that situation is adversity can become an excuse or right. it can become a reason. Wow. And our community chose to make it a reason, a reason to stand up, dust ourselves off, and reach for higher heights. That's the lesson. Right. And so you've obviously came a long way since 1970. You initially took a sales job at Pepsi right out of college. How did that early career experience shape your professional growth? Well, I mentioned amazing parents, and my mom and dad helped me think through how I would navigate my career because I remember coming out of college at Marshall, mm -hmm. and I had a couple of offers. Some were local. One was Pepsi. They were going to move me to Indianapolis, and I sat down, and I said, how do I make this decision? Right. I'm afraid if I make the wrong decision, my career will be over. Right. And, of course, my dad, who was wise, he laughed, and he said, son, there's three things I want you to keep in the back of your mind throughout the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. The first is always choose the thing that makes your heart beat the fastest. Right. The mission, the values that speak to you and your purpose. Right. The second is choose a place that will surround you with people more talented than you 
smarter mm -hmm. than you yes. because you'll always have to stretch and grow just to keep pace and you will constantly be learning. Right. The third is make sure that you can pay your bills. Do not take a job for the title and the money because eventually your standard of living will catch up with your income and you'll be struggling just like you were. That's, that's, that's great advice. Yeah, just <laughs> honor your commitments right. and pay your bills. And so as I was sitting here and looking at these options, Pepsi mm -hmm. rose to the top. At that time, in 1986, they were on the cover of Fortune magazine and the article was Pepsi recruits eagles and teaches them to fly in formation. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, what an amazing company. I'll be surrounded by all these superstars, which I was. Right. And I'll have the chance to go in and learn and grow every day. So it was an amazing choice that validated my dad, my dad and my mom's principles. But the second thing I'll tell you is I got to experience how much my upbringing in West Virginia was going to be helpful in my career. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you a quick story about that. Okay. My dad was the mayor in our hometown. And when he was the mayor, he was popular for riding the sanitation trucks every week as the garbage men and women would go and collect wow. sanitation trash. Yeah. And I came home one day and I said, Dad, why do you ride the garbage trucks? Right. And he said, son, I'll tell you why. First of all, there's no better way to learn your employees' lives than to sit with yes. them for eight hours in the cab of a truck and find out what keeps them awake at night, what their right. family is going through. And the second is if you really want to know your organization, or in this case your city, mm -hmm. don't go down the front yard where they've got it all prettied up. Go down You're the alley. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And yes. so that such, had such an impact on me that when I got to Pepsi, my first job was to supervise six drivers who delivered soft drinks mm -hmm. to the stores. And I became known as the district manager who would ride the routes with right. the salespeople. And if they called in sick, I would deliver the soft drinks for them. Mm -hmm. And everyone would say, right. why is he always on the truck? Why isn't he in the office? Why isn't he going out and calling on headquarter accounts? And I'll tell right. you what happened. We won every single sales contest. Really? Wow. Because those drivers knew that I cared about them and their families, that I was mm -hmm. willing to do the work with them. Yes. I knew what the dirty side of the job was, and they never forgot it, and they always paid it forward. So servant leadership mm -hmm. was the greatest lesson I got coming out of Pepsi, and I learned that from my mom and dad. Servant leadership, that's awesome. Yeah. And after that, you quickly climbed a corporate ladder at companies like 7up, Direct Mail Marketing, before joining ADP. What drove your ambition to advance your career so early? You know, uh, Jalen, I've got this reputation that I tend to run towards a challenge, mm -hmm. not from it. And I Absolutely. love it. I love it when someone tells me, oh, those are insurmountable odds. There's no right. way you're going to be able to do that. And in every one of those situations, that's what attracted me. Mm -hmm. So 7up called and said, we would like to offer you the opportunity to be the general manager of the 7up company of Akron. And everyone said, you've got to be kidding me. This was in the heat of the cola wars, Pepsi versus right. Coke. Seven Up was a distant third. And I thought, wow, that has to be cool, man. Yes. To be in third place, not even close to the resources that Pepsi and Coke have. Mm -hmm. What if we can go in and shock the world? And so right. I really jumped at the opportunity to mm -hmm. be the underdog. And then if you go to the direct mail marketing company, Advo, they mm -hmm. were early in the days of big data and mm -hmm. algorithms as a way to get a more targeted message. This was even before the internet. Right. And I fell in love with this notion of this pioneering big data and algorithms, which now, of course, has given birth to large language yes. models and artificial general intelligence. So mm -hmm. I love this exploration of something that had not been figured out. And then ADP was about to launch the first internet payroll product in the dot-com boom. And they wow. gave me the chance to go down and start this mm -hmm. initiative inside this big company to literally compete with Silicon Valley. Wow. So in all three instances, I ran into the problem, not away from it. I screwed up and made mistakes. At ADP, I made a $40 million mistake. I failed forward. $40 in every, million. Dollars. $40 wow. million. Dollars. I convinced our board mm -hmm. that we could sign an exclusive contract with two major portals, AOL and Microsoft uh -huh. at the time and that we wouldn't need as much of our sales force and therefore it would be more efficient and we would sell more units. And with $40 million invested in that, mm -hmm. we ended up getting about 15 sales. And the average sale was $1,800. Now higher math will tell you, right, 15 right, times right, 1,800 yes. is not no 40 million. Near, no, nowhere near. But I have to give ADP and their board credit because mm -hmm. when I went in and presented to them, I said, here's what I thought, here's where I was wrong, and this is what I would do differently. And what they said to me is, congratulations. The first thing is, you have proven our pundits wrong. There is no way we will get disrupted by the internet without a complimentary sales force. Right. 
The second thing is your team built the first hosted payroll product and we're going to put that product in the bag of our sales force and we're wow. going to be first to market. Yes. And the third is we just invested $40 million in you and you made a big mistake. We don't want you to make that mistake again. Right. We want you to go out and make a bunch of new mistakes because that's how we learn and they right. promoted me. They and promoted so me. they promoted me, Jalen. So from right. that day forward, I have always challenged myself mm -hmm. and my teams to fail forward to treat no success and failure as the same, an opportunity to learn. Wow, that's amazing. So when you inherited the role as CEO of Intuit in 2008, the company was already 25 years old with products like TurboTax and QuickBooks. How challenging was it to take on such an already established company? First of all, it was a privilege. Mm -hmm. I stood on the shoulders of giants. And with an established brand, the only thing more challenging than an established brand is a brand that no one knows. So I had this incredibly iconic company. I'd had the chance to serve in three of its businesses over five mm -hmm. years. And perhaps best of all, the legendary leaders who came before me were still actively engaged. So we had Scott Cook, the founder, who's still right, very yes. much involved to this mm -hmm. day. Bill Campbell, the iconic coach of the Valley, also known as the right. Trillion Dollar Coach. He was the chair of the board. Wow. My predecessor, Steve Bennett, who had come from General Electric and was an iconic leader, he was right. still involved in the board. So I had these amazing people to fall back on, and each one gave me wisdom. Right. What I needed to do was look at it with fresh eyes, mm -hmm. not come in with answers, but come in with questions. So right. I got a great piece of advice, which was to conduct a listening tour. Even though I was an insider who had led three of the businesses over five years, mm -hmm. I went out and interviewed employees, managers, board members, fellow CEOs, and shareholders. Right. And I asked them the same three questions. What is the greatest untapped opportunity you see before us that we have not capitalized on? The second, what is the greatest risk or concern you see ahead of us that mm -hmm. if we don't make an adjustment, we're in trouble? Right. And the third is, what's the one thing I could do to screw it up? And what was right. incredible, Jalen, is the themes were very consistent. It didn't matter who I asked. The first they said is we have got to lean into hosted products. We've got right. to lean into the cloud. So we called it connected services. And the three trends in 2007, 2008, if you recall, was social. Zuckerberg mm -hmm. had just moved off yes. of the educational campuses and went into dot-com world. Yeah. Start launching. The yeah. second was mobile. Steve Jobs and Apple mm -hmm. had just launched the iPhone. And the third was global. With hosted products, you can now do business across many geographies. So right. we launched a strategy called a connected service strategy with social, mobile, and global, and the rest was history. Wow. And so if you could have foreseen the remarkable success you had while transforming into it over the next decade, with the market cap soaring sevenfold to $51 billion and nearly doubling to $6 billion by 2018, what was the keys to unlocking that trajectory? The keys were recognizing my role as a leader was to create an environment where the world's top talent mm -hmm. could do the best work of their lives and then get the hell out of the way. Right. And so what we ended up doing is we wanted to be at that time a 25 year old startup now it's 41 years old right. and so we embraced an environment of design thinking mm -hmm. every employee in the company was trained on the Silicon Valley techniques of design thinking which is fall in love with the problem not your idea go super deep to understand what is the issue getting in the way of the end user the second is then go broad to go narrow come up with at least seven different ways that you can solve that problem right. not one because otherwise you'll fall in love with your idea and then the third is run rapid experiments, low cost, scrappy experiments, mm -hmm. and validate or disprove your hypothesis. And whichever one of those seven ideas emerges, that's what you double down on. Right. And so we created this environment where every employee knew what our strategy was, connected mm -hmm. services, social, mobile, and global. Right. They came up with ideas, they ran experiments, and then they ran to show me which ones worked, and those are the ones I funded. So my job was easy, was right. simply to bet yes. on the winners that had already been proven. In fact, I'll give you an example. I went down to TurboTax, which was one of the businesses mm -hmm. I had the chance to run before I became CEO, right. and I talked about this elegant strategy we had written together, connected services, social, mobile, and global. Right. And one of the engineers, as candid as they could be, said, what the heck does doing taxes have to do with a mobile phone? And I said, I have no idea. But I know that the mobile phone is here, and if someone figures it out, it yes. better be us. Mm -hmm. And so within eight weeks, they came back and showed me the very first prototype where you could use a phone. And this was long before, and now everybody mm -hmm. does it. They took pictures of tax documents on the phone, 
optical character recognition, read the data, pre-populated TurboTax, wow. and you could get a return done yeah. in literally one-third of the time. We were first to market, and it is now the market share leader. I didn't have the answer. I right. simply had the question, created the space for them to do experiments, and then the rest was history. Wow. So work hard, be kind, take pride. What does that mean to you? Those three phrases describe the values that I came out of West Virginia truly celebrating and appreciating. Mm -hmm. I ended up using that as my catchphrase throughout my career at Intuit. In fact, now those words are on the side of a building. Yes. But what people didn't realize was I had gotten a, a gift at Christmas time by one of my daughters and it had this barn wood and on there emblazoned in barn wood was work hard, be kind, take pride. Right. I learned later that that is actually a phrase that Barnwood Builders, which is an HGTV show yes. based on builders right here in West Virginia, uses. Wow. And as soon as I found out that they used that phrase, uh -huh. I went and visited the owner of Barnwood Builders. And I said, I have a confession to make and a story to share. Mm -hmm. The confession to make is I had no idea you used this phrase. I got this as a gift that must have been one of the items you've produced right. in a store <laughs> that my daughter bought. But it so spoke to me and moved me emotionally that I now sign every email and finish every all hands in right. town hall with yes. this phrase. I said, so the confession is that that is now on the side of a building. I hope I didn't violate any copyright rules. Right. And he laughed in classic West Virginia fashion. He said, Brad, this describes who we are. I didn't copyright that. I'm not looking for royalty. In fact, that. all I can tell you is I'm proud that I the rest that. of the world mm -hmm. now uses that phrase. And so I have never stopped talking about working hard, being kind, and taking right. pride. And I'm going to give full attribution to my friends at Barnwood Builders for having inspired me too. That's awesome. So you also encourage others to follow that which makes your heart beat the fastest. As a father, a husband, a son, president of Marshall University, former CEO, what would you say makes Brad Smith heart beat the fastest? When I see ordinary people achieve extraordinary things. Wow. When the underdog shocks the world mm -hmm. and shows people that we're all capable of greatness. The job of a leader is never to put greatness into somebody. God already did that. Right. Our job is to create the conditions where their greatness can shine. So I am very proud, for instance, at Marshall University. 57% of our students this year are the first in their family to attend college. Wow. But when you look at the 120,000 alumni that have walked through the halls of Marshall University mm -hmm. since 1837, they include admirals and generals, mm -hmm. Fortune 500 CEOs, governors, senators, and congressmen. They include Pulitzer Prize, excuse me, uh, Pulitzer Prize winners, you have Tony winners, mm -hmm. you have scientists, lawyers, doctors, all these amazing people. And by the way, sitting in this room, the Nate Ruffin room, yes. Yes. we also have pro athletes, we mm -hmm. have pro coaches, we have Heisman Trophy finalists. Yeah. So we may come from humble beginnings, mm -hmm. but we go out and show the world that we can reach the highest heights in our chosen profession. So that is what makes my heart beat fast. Mm -hmm. It's to see ordinary people achieve extraordinary things. Right. And so while on the top of our hearts, you've donated tens of millions of dollars to the state of West Virginia, Marshall University, and WVU, my alma mater, but what's driving your passion to give back locally? First and foremost, anything I've ever achieved in life is because someone here in this state and in this community saw something mm -hmm. that I didn't see in myself. And they invested in me. Right. They believed in me. They infused me with confidence and the willingness to go out and try. Mm -hmm. And I've never forgotten that. And if you hear the song by Tim McGraw, Humble and Kind, right. the last phrase is when you get to where you're going, don't forget to stop and turn back around and help the next one in line. Wow. Always be humble and kind. Mm -hmm. And so when I got out to California and Silicon Valley, I realized that this amazing life that I was living was because of amazing people who stood behind me and cheered me on. Right. And now this is my chance and my wife's chance to come home mm -hmm. and to hold the door for the next generation. That's amazing. And so you also launched the Brad B. Smith Business Incubator to provide entrepreneur resources and mentorship, which is right down the street here. What was your inspiration behind creating that facility? 
Well, it goes to the reality that we all live in. And Steve Case, who's now at Revolution, he mm -hmm. launched a venture capital firm called Rise of the Rest, but he was famous for being a co-founder of AOL, America Online, back in the day. Oh, wow. And Steve Case and I have done work together. In fact, we're a limited partner that invests in that fund. Mm -hmm. But he talks about the 75% reality. Yes. And the 75% reality is that 75% of those graduating high school today don't want to go to work for another company. Mm -hmm. They want to start their own business or they want to be in a highly entrepreneurial company where they can start something inside of that company. Right. The second 75% is 75% of all net new jobs were created by startups, not mm -hmm. by large established companies because many times they're laying off while they're hiring. It's the right. net new jobs that come from startups. And the third is 75% of all venture capital tends to go to the coasts. It goes to California, mm -hmm. New York, and Boston. And here you got these amazing entrepreneurial people living between the coasts. Yes. I've always old. said, yeah, mm -hmm. I've always said if your car is going to break down, break down in West Virginia because we're kind enough yeah. to stop and crafty enough to still oh, know yeah. how to fix oh, it. Yeah. And so for us, what we wanted to do is we wanted to be able to level the playing field of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, lean into entrepreneurship we can create the next Amazon, the next Intuit, the next Microsoft right here in these Appalachian Mountains. Our past came from the ground. Right. Our future is in the cloud. And we have the opportunity to create amazing businesses, capital mm -hmm. light opportunities right here in West Virginia. That's amazing. And to add to that, what advice would you give entrepreneurs like myself who are aspiring towards ambitious goals? As I would say today, we typically look for overnight success. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you teed it up in the way you asked the question and some of this I shared a little earlier my advice would be really understand and apply design thinking because it'll take you through three very important takeaways one is you'll fall in love with the problem not an idea right. the second you'll learn to treat success and failure the same by running these experiments and validating or disproving the ones that work or don't work mm -hmm. and then the third is celebrate grit celebrate getting up, dusting yourself off, and knowing that there is no such thing as an overnight success. In fact, there's been a lot of analysis done that if you look at how long it takes from an idea to become impact at scale, mm -hmm. and you look at how long it took Google or Facebook or an overnight artist who's in Nashville that all of a sudden is popular, right. or the Beatles who played for years in Germany in the basement, mm -hmm. it's about seven years. Right. It's almost seven years in every instance from the idea this thing took off and they actually toil underneath the radar, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden they come out and they go, whoa, an overnight success. Yes. So patience and mm -hmm. grit are so important, and that would be my advice. Design thinking, success and failure are simply a way to learn and be patient and right. persistent. Because I'll be honest, I think that's one of the things that I have a hard time with is, and it may be a social media thing, maybe because we're looking at other people and see what they have and ask ourselves, why can't we be there, or why are we not at that point yet in life? So yeah. that's... Cool you bring that up. Well, you know, and I'll share with you a great piece of career advice that I've offered others, and mm -hmm. I learned it from Meg Whitman. Meg Whitman was an iconic leader, various different roles, uh, had led at Disney, had been at Bank Consulting, ran eBay and PayPal, mm -hmm. ultimately ended her career running at HP or led HP, ran for governor of California, just an amazing woman across every dimension. Right. And I heard her getting interviewed once, and they asked her, what's the best career advice to get to the top as quickly as possible? Hmm. And she said, play golf. And really? everyone said, play golf? I hate golf, man. It's four hours. She said, no, no, it's a metaphor. I don't mean play golf. <laughs> what I mean is if you do play golf and apply this to your career, or in right. this case, a startup, mm -hmm. and it comes down to patience. The first thing she said is they teach you in golf, keep your head down, focus on your own ball. The second, then practice the mechanics. Pull your arm back, don't bend your elbow, make contact with the ball, follow through, never look up through the whole thing, don't right. watch your ball. And the third is you never look over at how the other player is swinging because mm -hmm. everyone's swing is authentic to them. If you play golf, if you keep your head down and do the job you're supposed to be doing today, mm -hmm. if you work on your own mechanics and if you don't worry about how somebody else is doing, you're going to have a better score every time you're out. The same thing with a startup is right. don't look at social media. Don't worry about who got there faster. Right. Just yeah. focus on your game. Your yeah. score is going to get better. Your job is to be better than you were yesterday. Yeah. So you also mentioned this, but it's like you served on boards of Yahoo, Nordstrom, SurveyMonkey, and now Humana and Amazon. These are major companies. 
So what is it like being part of those boards? It's incredible. It's humbling. It's a privilege. Mm -hmm. It's also a great reminder that we're all in the people business. Right. Whether you're serving any of those companies from retail to health insurance to a massive online everything store. Mm -hmm. If you close your eyes in the boardroom, the conversations are the same. How do we attract and retain the top talent? Mm -hmm. How do we create an environment where they can move with agility and speed, not have a lot of friction? How do we contend with the reality of things like artificial general intelligence? Right. How do we make sure cybersecurity is mm -hmm. pervasive in everything we do? Right. How do we do good for the communities? How do we do the role that society expects us to play? All those discussions are happening in right. every one of those boardrooms. The other thing that you walk away understanding is the role of a board member is different than the role of management. Mm -hmm. It's summed up really well by Stanford. They actually have a best practices program they teach on board governance. And if you had to boil it down, it is nose in, hands out. Right. You bring your knowledge, your expertise, you ask good provocative questions so mm -hmm. that management has no blind spots, but you don't put your hand on the wheel and act like you're managing the company. Right. That's not your job. And so it keeps you in a very engaged sort of understanding what's happening around the world mm -hmm. space. But it also reminds you, your job is not to run the company. Your job is to ask the right questions, to inspire, and to network and connect them with others. Right. And is there a process to that, to be a part of a board? Do they ask you to be part of the board? Is it like an application process? Or how does that happen? It's usually a combination of two things. Mm -hmm. So most boards will sit down and look at the next five to ten years, the trends that are happening, the strategies they have in place. Right. And then they ask themselves, do we have the right skills and experience in the boardroom to help guide and navigate management through that transition? Mm -hmm. And it's known as a strategic skills matrix. And what you typically do is across the top on the x-axis, you'll list the things you wish you had. I wish we had somebody who had AI experience. I wish right. we had somebody who had government and policy. Mm -hmm. You name it. And then down the y-axis, you have your current board members, and you ask everybody to check, what do you bring to the table today? And when right. you see gaps, you circle the gap, and you say, when one of our board members retires or for whatever reason steps off, the next board member needs to come with these experiences. So mm -hmm. the first thing is you start with, what do you need? And then from there, it's usually a recruiting process mm -hmm. where they will hire an executive recruiter, management will weigh in, and you'll get a list of names, and they come and interview you. And it's a pretty rigorous interview. Right. Because well, you're yeah. talking about yes. CEOs and you know mm -hmm. leaders from every genre all going for typically between 8 and 12 positions on a board. Right. So it is definitely a pretty rigorous process, but it's usually informed by what's needed to help the company navigate the next decade. Yes, sir. So I mentioned you're on the board of directors for Amazon, the largest online retailer in the world. I have to know, what is it like working with business moguls like Jeff Bezos, Judy McGrath, Andy Jassy, and others that may not even be part of Amazon? Bill Gates, if you have worked with him before. I have. Well, what is that like? I have. Well, it's humbling. Mm -hmm. These are the people that we all learn from, we all study. Mm -hmm. Throughout my entire career, and definitely during my time at Intuit, we learned everything we could about Amazon. Right. We adopted the working backwards techniques. We adopted the six-page narratives. Mm -hmm. We focused on how to have two pizza teams, small teams, no bigger than two pizzas can feed. How do we build velocity into our experimentation? Right. I shadowed Andy Jassy when I was a CEO and he was running AWS. He came down and watched me as I was CEO also lead. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of sort of exchange and partnership and collaboration and then right. one day to get a call and say, you're a candidate, and of course I had to go through the interview process, I was incredibly humbled because wow. it's like a PhD in leadership. You get mm -hmm. a chance to see firsthand the things you've been studying and trying to benchmark and mimic. Life, yes. Yeah, and so uh, I don't take a day for granted. And I'll tell you, when I go in, I have to work hard just to keep pace. But right. I love that. I love to be at the base of a steep learning curve. That's awesome. So. You had a very successful corporate career leading as into it as CEO. What was the most valuable leadership lesson you learned while doing your time in that role? It really comes back to the quote that Maya Angelou once said. Mm -hmm. In life, people will not remember what you said. They will not remember what you did. Mm -hmm. But they will always remember how you made them feel. And I realized and I learned that leadership is a what and a how position. Mm -hmm. 
The what is doing things like helping drive strategy and vision, making decisions that way. And the how is creating the environment where people know they're valued, they're invested in, their voice, and their contributions matter. Right. And so leadership for me is about the head, the heart, and the hands. You have to inspire with logic. Mm -hmm. You have to infuse them with passion and a right. reason to be a part of something bigger than themselves with their heart. And you have to be clear what their work does to contribute to the greater good with their hands. Mm -hmm. And that has been the greatest lesson is remember that it's about how we make people feel. Right how they see their work adding up to the bigger picture. That's the most important lesson that I've learned. Wow. And as you stepped down as Intuit CEO while still in your prime, what was the reason for making the pivotal decision at that specific point in time to become now the 38th president here at Marshall University? <laughs> well, first of all, I don't know if everyone would say that I stepped down when I was in my prime. Okay. I, I might have felt a little <laughs> right. creaky. You know, 11 years as a CEO is a long time. The right. average tenure, if you go Google it, somewhere between six and seven years, mm -hmm. and it varies up or down depending upon the impact of pandemic. But I would start by saying I had set mile markers mm -hmm. because I never wanted to be the athlete that stayed a year or two past their prime. Right. And people go, oh, he would have been able to complete that pass two yes, years ago. Yeah. He just doesn't have the zip on the ball right. anymore. I didn't want to do that. And so if anything, I wanted to go out like Deion Sanders, right. which is, oh, he right. had two or three more years in yes. him. Why didn't he do that? Now, I don't know if I got it timed right or not, but for me, I did choose the markers. Right. And my markers for me were three. Mm -hmm. The first thing I wanted to do is make sure that I could demonstrate that the company was moving in a good direction, that we had transformed from what had been a desktop software company to a cloud-based company mm -hmm. that had become a platform, right. a platform upon which others could build. So I wanted to show that we had made that transition. Mm -hmm. The second is I wanted to give the board two or three very viable options of who could be CEO successors. I feel gotcha. like it's the job of a leader to build the bench. Yes. And so we actually had four individuals, all four of whom went on to be CEOs, one of Intuit, and then the others are now leading other companies in Silicon wow. Valley. And then the third is I wanted to leave when I had more questions and answers. I did want to leave when I had more gas in the tank. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to leave when I was bored, frustrated, agitated, because I wanted people to remember me still with sparks saying, right. oh, I'm just excited. So that was how I chose the time. Right. Now, how I ended up being president of Marshall was completely separate from that. A cocktail I, napkin. Yeah, I'm an <laughs> accidental president. Right. My wife and I had started our foundation, right. and we were pouring in to West Virginia and Appalachia in mm -hmm. support of leveling the playing field. And we chose three areas, education, entrepreneurship, and the environment. So we were funding first-generation kids who had never had a family member go to college to get a full ride to Marshall. Mm -hmm. We had been funding K-12 through school systems with donors too, so all the public school teachers would get the supplies they needed for the classrooms. We funded West Virginia University. Yes. And we funded things like the Ascend program, the remote worker program, mm -hmm. and the Science Adventure School for middle school kids to go out and camp and find out physics from a zip line. Right. Be able to do the math. It's, oh, this isn't just having fun. There's actually math behind this. Right. So we were doing all these things, and my success or my predecessor at Marshall, the president before me, right. let me know he was going to step down. And I'd been supporting him. And I said, oh, don't do this. He said, you know what, I've got an idea. I think you should put your name in the hat. Wow. I said, you've got to be kidding me. I am the least qualified person to lead an academic institution. Mm -hmm. I have an MBA. I don't have a PhD. I've been in private industry. I have not been in academia. Right. And he said, Brad, the business model's changing. That's what we need. So I went out and spoke to 18 sitting and former presidents of universities. Wow. And I asked them, is this crazy? And they said, no, put your name in the hat. So I was one of 117 applicants. 16 of us got narrowed down and invited to go interview in Columbus, Ohio, off campus. Five of us got invited to come to campus. Four had PhDs, mm -hmm. and I was the one that didn't belong. <laughs> I was the non-traditional president. Right. But through a combination mm -hmm. of the community knowing that I care about this place, I was invested in this place, the faculty betting on the fact that I was going to try to do what I did at Intuit, which is create an environment for them to do the best work of their lives, right. and students knowing that I was them. I came from the same community. Mm -hmm. My brothers and I were first in my family to go to college, and I wanted to be here for the reason of holding the door for them. They right. gave me the shot.
and two and a half years in, it's the privilege of a lifetime. Well, they made the right decision. I will well, say that. I don't know about that. I will tell you, my <laughs> wife and I tell people we traded an amazing profession right. for an inspiring purpose. Wow. So now president here at Marshall University, you've outlined the vision, Marshall for All, Marshall Forever, that's aimed at increasing affordability, flexibility, and achievement for students. What specific strategies are you implementing to ensure the success for Marshall for All, Marshall Forever? We're very excited about this vision and strategy, and what makes me most excited is it was written by the entire campus community. Mm -hmm. We ended up going through 38 listening sessions with more than 1,000 participants. They gave 1,200 ideas. We had 60 different workshops and interviews, and everyone has their fingerprints on the strategy. And it's really broken down into the reality in which higher education now operates. Mm -hmm. It's getting completely disrupted, and it's being disrupted by the three Ds. The three Ds are demographics, digital, and doubt. Demographics are, by the year 2025, there will be fewer high school students graduating as seniors and ready to go to college. In fact, that number is hmm. declining 15% across the country because the prior generation chose to have fewer babies. And the second is, of those that are graduating, 15% mm -hmm. less high school seniors, 12% fewer are deciding to go to college. They're right. reading about their heroes who dropped out of college and started a business, and they say, I don't need I to don't do need that. This, right. So you've got this huge demographic cliff. Mm -hmm. Then you've got digital. And whether you're talking about YouTube or Khan Academy or Coursera or large language models and chat GPT, mm -hmm. the way people want to learn and the way education is being delivered is being completely reinvented before our eyes. Right. And then the last is doubt. And doubt is you've got 43 million people in the United States today carrying $1.7 trillion of student loan debt and they're mm -hmm. saying, I don't know if there's a return on investment here. Right. So with all of those things as the reality, we leaned into that problem, not ran away from it. Right. And we did Marshall for All, Marshall Forever. Mm -hmm. It is focused on teaching an in-demand curriculum that makes sure we have skills that are relevant for the 21st century, mm -hmm. as well as mindset and communication and critical thinking and collaboration, all those liberal arts aspects, right. which have never been more important in such a polarized and divisive society. So in-demand curriculum, mm -hmm. on-demand access, leveraging digital technology, so not only in the classroom, but online and all the different ways of learning. And then we chose six areas to be distinctive, and this is where the answer to your question comes out. We can't be all things to all people. In fact, in Silicon Valley, they teach you organizations very seldom die of starvation. Right. They dive into gestion. They try to do too many things, and mm -hmm. they spread the resources too thin. So we said, we're going to be a great, comprehensive university, but our six pillars are going to be cybersecurity, mm -hmm. health care, in particular social determinants of health, like rural health, advanced manufacturing, new energy, aviation, and entrepreneurship. If you look at those six areas, they're not only areas that the world has a tremendous need for, they're areas that we've demonstrated excellence. Right. Our students were the national champs in cybersecurity in 2020, and this year, the national coach for the U.S. cybersecurity team is a Marshall professor. Josh, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. so if you put all that together, we said mm -hmm. that's going to be who we are. And as a result, our strategy is producing results. And I'm right. excited because it's our strategy. We wrote it together. Mm -hmm. Wow. In your statement, we grow students, not fees. And that couldn't be more true. Here are the numbers. You reverse a 13-year decline in enrollment to an overall 4.5% growth, with freshman enrollment up 13%. What do you look forward to most now as a president here at Marshall University? We look forward to demonstrating that Marshall University is a wonderful example, that you're able to become that which you seek to be without losing who you are in the process. Mm. Marshall University has always been a prosperity platform. Mm -hmm. A platform is a surface that you can stand on that's elevated relative to the surrounding area. Right. And as a result, you can reach higher heights. I mentioned how many of our students come first in their family to go to college. Mm -hmm. I didn't mention that roughly 28% come from families below the poverty line. In fact, wow. we have less than 10% of our students who come from a household income of more than $110,000. So they wow. come from these humble beginnings. Mm -hmm. But they come here, and as this prosperity platform, we accelerate their individual success. They go out and reach the top of their professions. We accelerate innovative ideas. We're now training design thinking. Our entire academy 
right. from our Board of Governors to our Cabinet to our Deans to our Chairs, our faculty, and now first-year freshmen are all being trained right. on the Silicon Valley tech techniques of design thinking. That's awesome. And we're advancing our research, so our innovation is growing. And then the third is economic impact. Mm -hmm. And economic impact today, for every dollar the state invests in Marshall, we produce a 14x return. So when you look at this prosperity platform, which we have always been, that accelerates individual success, innovative ideas, and economic impact, mm -hmm. the Marshall for All, Marshall Forever strategy has put a bold goal out there that by our 200th anniversary, 2037, right. we will have 100% of our students placed in a job of their choice with zero student loan debt. We're going to wow. grow our researches, our research grants and contract dollars from 65 million today to 150 million, and we're going to increase the number of startups in West Virginia 3x mm -hmm. through design thinking, and we're going to grow that return on investment from 14x for every dollar to 30x. Right. And so those are our goals, and I believe that they're all possible because we're already showing that we can do it. Right. And just for the viewers or students or high school students who may be watching, what is the process? to apply to the Marshall for All, Marshall Forever? Is that pre prerequisites or how, how does that happen? It's a great question. And so today, if you go online and you apply to Marshall, mm -hmm. you can type in Marshall for All, Marshall Forever. Okay. And it will route your application to the group. And then today we're randomly selecting it because we're bringing right. 100 in at a time, even though our, our freshman class will be over 1,000 right. when they come in. We're selecting 100 because we're running water through the pipes. We're testing to make sure that we provide the right wraparound services, helping them be successful. But today, the mm -hmm. first 100 students that entered this past fall, they are coming in and having a higher GPA. Wow. They're retaining at a higher rate, and yet when you look at them, they come from very financially distressed situations. Mm -hmm. Many of them come from the foster care system, but they are coming in and showing the world how greatness exists in all of us. That's amazing. And you already mentioned this, but we're all born angels with one wing, and the way we fly is by holding on to one another. That refers to your Wing to Wing Foundation, and as you said, where the goal is to tackle the 75% reality and to level the playing field for entrepreneurs in overlooked communities. What made you and your wife say, you know what, we want to start this foundation? We believe that if you look at the number of geniuses in the world, mm -hmm. they exist just as often and frequently in these communities as they do in the places we would think about, these big metropolitan cities. Right. What hasn't always been equally accessible are the resources for them to be able to get the education they want mm -hmm. or the jobs for them to not have to leave. Right. And so we have leaned in with the Wing to Wing Foundation to level the playing field of opportunity mm -hmm. through providing education, right. entrepreneurship that creates jobs, and the environment by capitalizing on this beautiful state, yes. the mountain state, 90% trees and inviting people through the Ascend program, the remote worker program, to choose West Virginia as their forever home. And with them, they bring their family, they bring their talents, they bring their income, they bring the remote work, so mm -hmm. they don't take jobs here, they bring their jobs with them because they're allowed to live anywhere. Right. And they get to live, work, and play in a state where we have more miles of whitewater rapids than any place else in the world except Australia. Not Colorado, wow. Australia. Wow. So we have these incredible assets yeah. in the environment. So. What led us to come back is to say, we've let John Denver and John Denver's legacy tell our story mm -hmm. for far too long, and he did an amazing job. Everywhere around the world, people can sing country roads. Yes. But then we allowed reality TV to shape our narrative in a way that is mm -hmm. not representative of who we are. Right. So we are now grabbing the megaphone, and we're telling the story of who we are, and right. we're showing people what we're capable of being. And for me, that gets very exciting and I'll share one important message yes, with sir. you. I'm sorry this is a longer answer. No, yes, sir. But Appalachians and in this case West Virginians have mm -hmm. always answered the call. When our nation has needed us, we mined the coal, we forged the steel, mm -hmm. we built the roads, we manufactured the trucks, and right. we fought the wars. In fact, more people serve in our military per capita in West Virginia than any other state in the nation. And then when our president said, we need to put a man on the moon during the Sputnik moment, mm -hmm. it was Homer Hickam and coal miner's sons depicted in the book October Sky right. that built the first NASA rockets. And then we right. needed to get Neil Armstrong home, and it was Katherine Johnson Catherine from Johnson, West Virginia yes. and yes. the hidden figures who did the calculations yes. to get him home. And today, 
Most of the metal in space is produced in a manufacturing plant in southern West Virginia called Constellium. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you, we have what it takes right. to help the nation in the 21st century. We have to stop believing the negative narrative and show people that we are still the hardworking people that are dreamers and doers. Right. That's why my wife and I founded right. the Wing to Wing Foundation. I have to mention this, and, and th th this is off script here, but when I graduated from Georgia Military College, I came here with, with, with seven friends, and they said we're going to West Virginia. I wanted to go to Texas, and I took the leap of faith, and I don't think I would be where I am today if I had not come here. The first cyber officer, you know, got my grad degree, and now I'm here working at such an amazing place. Um, and so much is wrapped into that, but if I didn't come to West Virginia, I don't think I would be here. So, um, yeah, it just means a lot to me, and I tell people that all, all the time. Yeah. You know, Jalen, we wouldn't be who we are if you hadn't chosen us. Yes, sir. That's the thing that makes this special. It's mm -hmm. a flywheel effect. Those who have the opportunity to go anywhere, when they choose us, they make us better. Right. And at the same time, you inspire those here to say, maybe I can be Jalen. Right. And then they try to reach higher heights as well, and it builds on each other. So that's where we are now. The sun is rising, right. and the opportunity is before us. Yeah. Yes, sir. And so we mentioned some big names throughout the interview, but who are the most impactful mentors or role models that guided you along your way? I've been blessed to learn from so many people, mm -hmm. and I'll be honest with you, he who borrows or steals from me steals twice, because I've borrowed from somebody else. Yes, sir. <laughs> and I love to be surrounded from, by students who teach me every day, and mm -hmm. faculty and staff who inspire me every day, but if I go back in life and think about, okay, who really stands out amongst all these amazing people that I mm -hmm. learned from, it would be my mom and dad. They taught me unconditional love, yes, sir. and they role modeled servant leadership, and I shared the story of my dad riding the sanitation trucks, mm -hmm. and my mother, who gave every fabric and fiber of her being to invest right. in her boys. That has always set the standard mm -hmm. for me. The second was Scott Cook and Bill Campbell. Scott Cook, the founder of Intuit, he's the most intellectually curious person you'll ever meet, and I believe that Tim McGraw wrote the song Humble and Kind about him. Yes, no sir. matter how much success he's had, he is so humble and so self-effacing. And Bill Campbell taught me bold thinking. He was a wartime general, mm -hmm. but he was also a compassionate coach. When he first met me, he said, I see two people, the person you are and the person you're capable of being. And I'm going to devote my life to introducing those two people. Wow. And he poured everything into me. Yes, so they were all incredibly impactful. And then last but not least is Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers' mm -hmm. Neighborhood. If right. you think about what Mr. Right. Rogers did, mm -hmm. we think of him as a puppeteer and a child whisperer right. with sing-alongs. But what he did is he devoted his life to improving the physical and mental well-being of children under the age of six. And he harnessed at the time the most disruptive technology of his day, which was television in the living room. And in the first week on the air, people didn't realize this, right. he took on death, divorce, mm. and war, and racism. Mm -hmm. All in the first week, in fact, there was an episode where there had been racial issues occurring in the South where they were pouring bleach into swimming pools wow. to try to segregate pools. And Mr. Mm -hmm. Rogers, that evening, called an audible, and he actually shot an episode where he had a wading pool, a little blue plastic pool filled with water in his backyard. Mm -hmm. He invited Officer Clemens to come into his backyard he took the shoes off of Officer Clemens and put his feet in the pool and said, you mind sharing this water with me? And that sent wow. the signal to everybody. And I love that. He had 33 years, the top rated show. Right. He is in the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. He's been presented an award by the President of the United States. And he is probably the most visionary and impactful leader I could imagine, Mr. Wow. Rogers. And he showed his kindness is not weakness. Yes, sir. That's amazing. And as someone who was trained in martial arts at a young age, yes. what are your hobbies now, or I would call it my happy place outside of work? I love, I love to read. Mm -hmm. I tease about being a wannabe Renaissance man. So I write poetry. I play I guitar. I like you are, though. You're doing a lot of stuff. No, I play guitar. <laughs> I play sax. Uh, I love history. So all those right. things for me keep me learning and at the base of a steep learning curve. Mm -hmm. And then I just absolutely adore my wife and my daughters and then being back home around my mom and my brothers. So right. I just love family. So 
the thing about a university president, someone asked me recently, hey, what's the difference between being CEO of a Fortune 500 company and the president of a university? And I said, mm -hmm. being a CEO is 24-7. Right. Being the president of a university is 48 by 14. The sun never yes. sets. Yes. So there is something All going time. on. So yes. I try to be at every activity I can, mm -hmm. every sporting event, every play, every lecture. That's amazing. I want to be at all those things and still fit these other things right. in. So that's what I've been doing. Awesome. Well, I mentioned this in my intro, but being named by Forbes, the richest man in the state of West Virginia, with a very high net worth of $900 million, I have to ask for myself too as well, how does one achieve that level of financial success? And... Do you ever sit back and realize how far you've come? Well, first, as you might imagine, that's not a ranking that I aspired to have published, and yes, it's sir. not one. In fact, I'll answer your question. That mm -hmm. The way you get there is by not making that your measure of success. Right. It really isn't. If you go mm -hmm. back to the phrase I shared earlier from Meg Whitman, play golf. Right. You know, simply keep your head down, focus on your mechanics, don't worry about how somebody else is doing, just do the job and be a good team mm -hmm. member. John Wooden, who was the famous coach of UCLA basketball, who won all those national championships in the 60s, mm -hmm. he said, a player that makes a team great is worth more than a great player. Right. I surrounded myself with people smarter than me, right. better than me, more talented than me, and honestly, just better human beings. Right. And all I ever tried to do was learn from them and be better than I was yesterday. Right. And the rest ends up being what it is. And I can tell you, the only thing I celebrate about that ranking is for many, many decades, if not centuries, people came to our state, they extracted our greatest resources, whether it came out of the ground or our people, mm -hmm. and they took it elsewhere. Well, I've had the opportunity or the blessing to earn some of that someplace else, and mm -hmm. I'm bringing it all right back here. I'm putting it all yes, right back into West Virginia. Yes, sir. That's amazing. So with all that you've accomplished, what still excites and energizes you most looking towards the future? I'm excited by the fact we're in the early innings mm -hmm. of our next chapter of GREAT. We have amazing things happening on our campus, in our community, in the state, and candidly in the nation and around the world. Think about the impact of large language models and artificial general intelligence. I mean, we're just at the dawn of a new era. Right. And what excites me is we have a seat at the table mm -hmm. right here. The students who are coming through this amazing institution are contributing to this future. Right. And they're pioneering the new way of doing things. Right. And it's so exciting for me to have the chance to see them flourish and to shine and mm -hmm. to shine a spotlight on them. In just the last few weeks, we've had an amazing segment, Soledad O'Brien did on Matter of Fact, wow. where she went in and showcased the students involved in Marshall for All, Marshall Forever. Mm -hmm. There was a segment on the Today Show talking about Ascend West Virginia, the remote worker program. Right. We're catching the eye of the world, and we have wow. the chance to show them that we have answered the call in the past, and we're going to answer the call again. Yeah, now. And I just want to see he I just want to have a seat at the table and celebrate yes, the amazing people doing stuff. Yes, sir. And for my last question, if you can instill one core value or principle in every graduated student here at Marsh University, entrepreneurs around the world or anyone looking for success, what would it be and why? That's a great question, Jalen. Can I cheat? Can I say two? <laughs> sure, yes sir. Two. Yep. I'll start with one you and I've talked about already, okay. which is curiosity quotient. Have a high CQ, mm -hmm. not just a high IQ. A high CQ is be a learn-it-all, not a right. know-it-all. Go into the world with fresh eyes, treat it like day one, have more questions and answers, uh -huh. and seek to understand before you seek to be understood. Right. Which takes me to my second, and I think equally, if not more important, be kind. Right. Be kind. It was once said about Martin Luther King that he learned to speak without being offensive. Right. He learned to listen without being defensive. Mm -hmm. And he left his adversary with their dignity at the end of the disagreement. Right. Kindness is not weakness. We have got to bring compassion to every situation. We have to try to understand somebody else's perspective. We have to walk in their shoes. We have to eliminate this polarized society that we currently have. Mm -hmm. Differences of opinion make us stronger, but we shouldn't personalize it and attack the individual. We should challenge the idea. Right. So I hope entrepreneurs, I hope the next generation, I hope you and me, Yes, sir. I hope all of us embrace our curiosity quotient and practice what our parents taught us. Yes, Be kind. Yes, sir. And as we wrap, tell me what is next 
for Brad Smith. What can the students, the people of West Virginia, and the viewers at home expect from you in the next five years? I'm all in. I'm going to give everything I have. My talent, what little that is, my time, and my treasure to investing in this next generation. Yes, sir. So that they can go out and show the world who they are and what we are capable of. There's an amazing parable that I'll finish up with that Bill Campbell, the trillion mm -hmm. dollar coach, taught me. Yes, sir. The parable simply starts with a man in a ditch and he struggled all day to try to get out, can't find a way out. Mm -hmm. The first person walks by and says, what's going on? He said, I'm stuck in this ditch. The guy throws him $100 bills down in and said, there you go, there's a bunch of resources and leaves. And the guy goes, great, I've got a lot of resources now, but I'm still in the ditch. Right. Second person comes by, what is going on? I'm stuck in the ditch. The guy goes, I believe in you, you've got greatness in you, I've seen you do harder things before, I'm sure you're going to get out right. and leaves. And the guy goes, great, I'm spiritually supported now, but I'm still stuck in the ditch. Mm -hmm. Third person comes by and she asks, what are you doing? He said, I'm stuck in the ditch. She jumped down in the ditch with him. The original guy goes, great, now we're both stuck. Right. And she said, no, I've been here before. I know the way out. That's what uh, you can expect yes, of me. I know what we get when we grow up in these communities. Mm -hmm. I know what it feels like to have people support you and believe in you. I have seen what it takes to be someplace else and to show them that we can stack up. And I also know you no longer have to leave to make any of that happen. I will be in the ditch, shoulder against the boulder, with yes, this sir. next generation to make it happen. What a way to end it. Well, that wraps it up for me, Brad. I want to say thank you for coming on. It's truly an honor and a pleasure. Thank you, Jay. Um, and I want to say, again, I'm happy to be a part of the Marshall family, a West Virginia guardsman, and a small business owner right here in Huntington. And that is thanks to people like you who are paving the way for me to hopefully be in a position like you are one day. So thank you. It really means a lot. Yes, sir. Thank you, Jalen, and thank you for your service. You make us proud. Yes, sir. Well. Brad Smith, everyone. Until next time, this is the business interview. Thank you. It's a blessing coming on the way. Mama stay strong. I'm going to get you off this section, eh? When I was young, she used to boot the make so we would play.